My name is Patricia Falcão and I'm a time-based media conservator here at Tate. This video will show you some of the work we do to preserve and display time-based media artworks at Tate. Time-based media art is really any artwork that has the dimension of time. This can be analogue in terms of film or slide. It also can be video, audio, performance and software-based art. Any form of contemporary art that engage with the idea of time can be considered time-based media. It's a very large and interesting definition. So Tate's mission is to promote the public understanding and engagement of modern and contemporary art. Our role is to care for and preserve artworks that are coming into the collection, but we also have a requirement to display those works so that the public can engage and enjoy them. Documentation really is at the heart of everything that we do. We document every process, task, display history and every decision that we've taken or decisions that we've decided not to take and why and what this provides is a really rich history across the lifespan of an artwork and you can go back and sort of watch the progression and perhaps change of an artwork and why those decisions were taken. A um, clear uh, and good example of a major uh, time-based media artwork shown at Tate recently is uh, Primitive by the artist um, Apichapong Versetakul. Primitive is a multi-platform work. It's a work that can be seen as a state of what the future of cinema is. It's composed of short video clips, it's composed of a film, it's composed of a proper installation. Projectors are happening on different screens and have been shot in different formats. So it's a very specific work that can take a different shape every time it gets displayed. So it's definitely a time-based media uh, multi-platform installation. In the case of Primitive, that's a really interesting work because that artist has a very clear idea of um, how he wants the works to be realised. It's a case of working along with him and the curator to make sure that that's possible in that space. So then I guess he's looking at the space just in terms of like, you know, purely creatively, how can my work function within that space? And then I guess part of our role in conjunction with the installation manager is to make sure that that's actually feasible technically and feasible in terms of budget. There was some hanging points in the ceiling of the East Tank in, in very particular places, none of which particularly lined up with where we wanted to put any equipment or screens. Um, so we had to work alongside um, a scaffolding contractor to create some rigging in the ceiling to give us our points where we wanted them. Um, we worked with a specialist who makes uh, screen stretchers to make a massive projection screen. That was in fact the biggest screen stretcher that he'd ever made, which was like 5 metres by 6.5 metres or something like that. So there was lots of challenges like that along the way. It's a perfect work that embodies the um, idea of liveness, which in the end perhaps is the DNA of what the time-based media work is. There is something alive somewhere that makes the work happening, unfolding and changing and taking shape throughout time. When we acquire time-based media artworks, it's really important that we work with the artists and our curatorial colleagues to understand either the different characteristics or components or aspects of that artwork that are critical to either the presentation, so display or installation, or are critical in terms of the preservation of that work. And what that means that we have to do is either know the strategy for successful preservation or working out what that strategy may be because the media and equipment that artists use is always pushing the envelope and the boundaries it really pushes us in terms of our technical knowledge and our conservation knowledge and our ethical understanding and requirements to be able to sort of successfully deal with these challenging works that come in. To preserve uh, time is media artwork. The key moment is even before an artwork comes into the collection, so once it's agreed, as in understanding what that artwork is. And by understanding the artwork, I mean understanding what the artist intends, how it should be displayed, and how it was produced. This will guide us throughout the whole life of an artwork in deciding how we will preserve it. We always ask to have the best possible quality 
for that media that relates to how this media was produced? I handle the video files like they are artworks, which they are, they are artworks. When we receive a new file, the first thing we do is to play it back with different uh, players, uh, QuickTime and also VLC. For instance, in this case, a work by Cyprian Murison, we open the file with QuickTime player and it plays correctly. And then when we open it with VLC, VLC cannot interpret it correctly, so it's playing back the colors incorrectly. This is not a problem with the, the codec or the video file, it's just the way VLC is interpreting the file. And this is quite uncommon as well for us uh, to find. Simultaneously, we look uh, into media info using terminal and we look for um, metadata, so video properties or this specific video properties, such as the video codec, uh, the duration, uh, bit rates. The other step that needs to happen or that is essential is that one understands that this media does evolve over time and it will become obsolete and therefore we do, we've had a policy for migration ever since uh, the department started really. This was very clearly defined for tapes, now, for, uh, now that we work mostly with files this is less clear cut but it does need to happen and we'll know, we know we will have to migrate every so often. Sometimes we need to um, change the files for sustainability purposes so that in the future we uh, are sure that we are going to be able to play them. The things that worry me when transcoding a file is uh, to make sure that the properties that are linked to the artist's intent or the aesthetics of the video are not um, changed during the process. So I mainly work in exhibition and displays, which means that half of the work is probably on site uh, installing. So analyzing media files for me mainly means uh, producing and checking exhibition formats. The most simple step and the first one is to actually watch a video file or listen if it's an audio file. So to actually assess what we have to work with. So the reason why I do have to encode the files to make an exhibition format is because normally uh, we do archive a master file, but every time we display a video, we have to make sure that it plays with the equipment. So there is a, a link between a format and the equipment that we're using. So most of the time we do produce a new exhibition formats. It's important to go back to master files because we have to make sure that we are looking at the copy that the artist submits so that we are not misinterpreting anything and we're not referring to something that is not the artwork. The master file is also uncompressed so it's the best in terms of quality uh, format that we can refer to to make any exhibition formats. The CRT technology or cathode ray tube as it stands for is probably familiar to you from old televisions that are big and heavy and, and deep uh, and the depth is required by the, the actual tube which fires the, the light energy or you might recognize the projector version of that technology the three colors separated into three tubes. Most of the works that we're showing on CRT monitors are, is uh, SD video and as a hangover a lot of the stuff that we show a lot of video work throughout the 60s and 70s is in that format. So we have a pool of around 130 of these CRT monitors of different sizes and different manufacturers. Some of them are designed to be stacked in video walls, some of them are designed to be shown independently, some of them have built-in speakers, some of them don't. Some of those monitors we would have dedicated as a set to a particular work and some of them are part of a pool that we would be able to pull from to show uh, an individual video work. Um, the reason that we have dedicated sets to a work is because um, through time the uh, phosphorus coating on the screen that the light from the tube reacts with becomes less bright over time 
and also retains the character of what it's previously shown as, known as image burn. So if you've shown something like a graphic strap for a long time, then the phosphorus coating would retain that image um, and in general would become less bright over time and also the colour balance of them can be affected as well. So if you were to take one of those monitors from a set, show a work on it for a year and then put it back with its uh, set, you would notice the difference with the other monitors. When modern display technology came along, people were so quick to think, oh, the CRT technology has been superseded so quickly, it's not bright, it's massive, it's heavy to carry around, and huge swathes of them were chucked away. And now, of course, we'd love to be able to get our hands on some of those. There's a lot of factors which influence the equipment that you would use for an exhibition. I guess, firstly, would be, is the aesthetics of the equipment is that conceptually linked to the work in any way? So therefore, if there's an advancement in technology, is it okay to use a, a, an equipment that might have like a different aesthetic? Aspect ratio is the first consideration of the work. So it was more common a while back to have video works in 4-3 aspect ratio, and now everything's like widescreen as we know it, or 16-9. So that's the first consideration. So you want to make sure that your projector supports that. In the case of Primitive, one of the main pieces of work was a projection that was 10 meters wide, which calls to have a, a really, really bright projector. And with projectors, I guess you get this law of diminishing returns, whereby a projector that's bright to a certain extent costs a certain amount, but to get a projector that's twice as bright as that costs four times as much. So there can be real difficulties in, given the financial constraints of installing works finding suitable equipment and inevitably this can create a, a compromise somewhere along the way but I think I guess the important thing is to work closely with cur curatorial and the artist to make sure that that's all being discussed along the way. I've been working with 16mm film and 35mm slides and um, with those technologies it's, it's never the same as to have a reproduction process in making the display media which then subsequently also changes while the work is on display until the media is no longer usable because it has diverted or aged too much and then you replace the format. So each time when a work is required for display, we look at the overall duration and try to identify how many different sets we need. So currently, as part of the new Tate Modern displays, we have Daria Martin's birds on display. When looking at the different ways in which film can be shown in a gallery, there is always the question whether the equipment is visible in the gallery itself, whether it may go in a projection booth. The great difference between cinema experience is that you would have a projectionist in the cinema who would just play the wheel from beginning to end and that's it. But in a museum, due to the daily opening hours and not being able to have a projectionist with each film work, we tend to play them of a looper, which is a, a box that sits on top or behind the projector with loads of wheels attached to it. And around that, the film is being looped and then it goes under, comes over, runs through the film, and then the end winds on to the outside. So rather than playing something to beginning to end, it's just playing continuously. So for that, I would say a film that has is 15 minutes has sound needs a print change about every three weeks. Then the longer the duration, the less frequent the print runs through the projector. So your overall usage and wear and tear is less. But then when you change a print that is 40 minutes and longer, it takes a lot more before it settles. When looking at the comparison between sort of latest technology, digital projectors and an analog technology is that within the digital world, I think your set of files, they're, they're good to go because there's no wear and tear. They're on a little SD card, in a media player or on a Mac mini, but there isn't really any aspect of deterioration. With analog, media such as slides or 60 millimeter film, there is constant wear and tear as the slide is exposed to the heat of the lamp inside the projector as well as dust. And then um, in addition to that for 60 millimeter film, it's just the movement and the friction in itself, then the light and the heat of the lamp. I think we are primarily dependent on analog film stocks and with analog photography having 
taken a massive nosedive over the last 15 years. It's, it's almost that we reassess the situation year by year in order to identify how much longer we can support it. We consider software-based any artwork that uses software as its medium. In the collection, we have artworks where software is used to track people in the space, create randomness, or to do web searches. So in this category, we would include things like internet art, or interactive installations, or even, for instance, 3D simulations like John Gerard's South Farm. I think the key difference between software-based artworks and other time-based media artworks is that software can do anything. So when you look at a computer, you don't really know what it's meant to be doing. And another difference is the diversity. So in the collection of eight works that we currently own, there are four different operating systems, seven programming languages, each computer is different, and each software is bespoke for each work. A simple example is Becoming by Michael Craig Martin, where the software is used to introduce an element of randomness into how the images appear and disappear from the screen. So there are three key preservation strategies that we are looking at at the moment. One is keeping the original hardware, so we will keep the artist's computer and we will create a backup of that. The other strategy is migration, moving from the original technology to a new technology that is more sustainable. And the third strategy is emulation. So we run the original software in a simulated environment. And for this, we are working with Klaus Raschert from the University of Freiburg and Dragon Espensheet from Rhizom in New York to test emulation in our context. I think our next challenge is scaling our current processes so that we can apply them to an increasing number of works in the collection. Tate built a dedicated cold storage specifically for film. It's kept at minus seven degrees and 35% relative humidity. And this is done because film materials will last much longer if they are kept under these conditions. Because there is a high risk in moving a material from room temperature to such low temperatures as we have in storage, we had to develop processes in how to move materials in and also how to move them out. The time is media store is kept at uh, 18 degrees and 40% uh, relative humidity, which is recommended for the videotape. For digital files that we only started receiving in the collection in the last five to seven years, we had to develop a new system on how to store them safely. And for that, we have worked in our um, infrastructure, but also our processes to ensure that any digital asset that we receive is stored safely, it's backed up correctly, and that we know at any moment that nothing has changed on that, those formats. In the process of developing our digital storage, we found that the available tools didn't meet our needs. We also found that within the community of uh, digital archivists and conservators, there were quite a few tools that would be adaptable to our needs. And all those communities are working in open source because this gives us the freedom to add to those tools according to our needs, but also means that we can profit from any changes that other people have made to those tools. And that is the key point, I think, that this collaboration means that the tool is better for all of us. Looking to the future, this means that we will will not be dependent on one company to develop the tool that we need. A community is essential because there are so many different fields that we are working on and you need expertise at so many levels that within an institution you, you just don't have it. For instance, as part of Pericles, we were able to work with Dave Rice, who is an archivist who also develops these tools. That Pericles workshop was great because it just enabled us to have new tools to do our daily researches and uh, to analyse our files and keep on finding what's the best way to assess our artworks. Because we are an evolving practice, it is useful and reassuring to understand what other institutions are doing and being able to learn from each other. For the project uh, Matters in Media Art, we collaborate with MoMA and SF MoMA in defining our best practices. And we can compare and see what are we doing in the same way, what do we do differently, and why do, do we do that differently. The MS Media works of a unique opportunity to collaborate uh, between departments and to push ahead the research within the museum, particularly if you're talking about work that has been uh, done outside the conventional frame of, of uh, modern and contemporary art. I think there's been a much 
greater or there's been an increase in the number of time-based media works either that we're collecting and also displaying and this has had a huge impact. Um, we can see this just over the last couple of years where we now are um, a team of 10 um, and that's a mixture of conservators and technicians to be able to address the increase in complexity. We are encountering more immersive environments in larger spaces, um, particularly if we think about Tate Modern, we have some huge spaces which we're asked to display time-based media artworks in and they are becoming complex, multi-dimensional, performative, immersive and we've encountered different elements of this but this is now all coming within almost like one artwork and this is now becoming our challenge not only in terms of the acquisition but also then the display. The future for time-based media conservation I think is going to be hugely exciting and challenging. If we think about all the technologies that artists now have available to them, this is really going to present an interesting preservation and display challenge as we continue to acquire these works. Very often we do refer to time-based media work as if we were bird watchers. You don't really need only to look and to consider the bird, you also need to consider the environment. In a digital landscape, what is the environment? It's actually an environment made of data. How do we conserve this data? It's a big question. It's not only the actual object that we can extract, it's more an actual living and growing environment that it's made of relationship. It is going to be a big challenge because so many works will be conceived and are conceived now as part of something that changes.